They start with a 25-minute presentation, and Dr. Hoven will give 25 minutes, then 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 4 minutes, 4 minutes, then we're going to have a five-minute break, and then question and answer. And how the question and answer is going to work is that they're passing out written forms, so the questions will be written and then chosen and then read to the debaters. And the format for the question and answer is the person who the question is directed to gets two minutes, and the other person gets one minute to respond. Now, and again, if you do cheer or yell for your favorite, you're going to be taking up their time. So please be quiet while they're talking. Let them get their presentations out, and let's all be respectful and have a good time tonight on the creation versus evolution debate. And just by who's passing out the questions, uh, the papers, where are they at? Okay. Well, I'm sure they're in good hands, and they'll be passed out during the debate. And again, five-minute break before the question and answer. Let's begin with Dr. Shermer. How we doing? Oh, wow, hope the fire marshal's not here. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I don't know, it's just sort of a psychic hunch I have. I got the feeling there's slightly more believers than non-believers here. I, I don't, <laughs> just a show of hands, how many of you believe in uh, a God, a personal God, like the Judeo-Christian God? Okay, well, um, oh, look at the time, and uh, <laughs> I believe there was a Laker game on tonight, uh, or was that last night? <laughs> well, I am Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society, the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We were handing out some propaganda, I mean, literature earlier. Uh, if you didn't get any, we do have a table in the back. My associates, Matt and David, are back there, happy to, to uh, help you out there. I am really glad to see so many people. It's a beautiful night. You don't have to be here. You could be out enjoying the great uh, outdoors, but we appreciate that. Obviously, there's great interest in the subject, a subject we deal a lot with at Skeptic. Um, we deal with it because it's a hugely popular American subject. Only in America, with a few other scattered places and a tiny bit in New Zealand, uh, is creationism even a subject of debate. But here it is. We are in America. This is a, a subject near and dear to many people's hearts, so we deal a lot with this. Um, Basically, skepticism, science, are the same. That is, a skeptic is not a position that you take, it's not a noun. I'm not a skeptic like I'm a thing. Oh, you're one of those skeptics. You don't believe anything. I believe lots of things, like, for example, evolution. It's not a position that you take, it's just an approach to claims. For example, when I investigated the Holocaust deniers, they thought, well, we're skeptics, we're skeptic of the Holocaust, and he's a skeptic, so we have a brother in arms. But in fact, I ended up being skeptical of the skeptic. So skepticism is just an approach. You can be a skeptic of a claim, you can be a skeptic of the skeptics. What we're after here is to look for natural explanations for phenomenon. For example, it's entirely possible that aliens landed on uh, Farmer Bob's Field in Pucker Brush, Kansas, and carved out skeptic.com as a promotional gimmick for our organization. However, I think it's more likely that we assume that this was um, created by Photoshop. That is, before we say something uh, is out of this world, we have to first make sure that it's not in this world. So, for example, it's possible that our governor <coughs> was successful in his campaign because aliens backed him. And, and by the way, that's Danny DeVito as uh, Cruz Bustamante, which I thought was very clever. Uh, I should know, parenthetically, I've been tracking these uh, alien images for about 20 years. This is the first alien I've ever seen that's been working out with biceps and triceps. <laughs> Arnold's got the aliens pumping iron. And by the way, you don't mind the informality of, it's a little warm in here, hey? A few bodies. So they got the air cranked up if you're hot. I guess this is as this is good as it's going to get. So uh, now when we talk about evolution creation, the first thing we need to decide or that you need to decide if you're open to the question, which creationism are you going to embrace? Here's a useful continuum. I've been debating creationists for nearly 20 years of all stripes. There's flat earthers, geocentrists, young earth creationists, old earth creationists, gap creationists, creationists that believe there was a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 to allow for geological time. Day-age creationism, that the days of Genesis represent geological epochs, therefore allowing for an old earth. Progressive creationism, evolutionary creationism, these are 
creationists who believe that God operates through the laws of nature, theistic evolution, which is largely part of the, the intelligent design movement, and finally down to the end of just materialistic evolutionists. So you need to ask yourself, which one is Kent Hovind part of? Which, which creationism are you interested in hearing about? Which one will be presented tonight? There's a bunch of different ones, and they all have different arguments. And interestingly, they uh, disagree amongst themselves. You can go to, for example, Answers in Genesis, which is a very conservative Christian creationist organization that disagrees with most of what uh, my debate opponent will say tonight. So there is great diversity here. You have to choose, pick and choose, and read, and figure out which part of the um, uh, creationism you want to embrace, if at all. Now, first of all, we have to recognize that, in fact, most people uh, embrace evolution. 96 million American Christians accept evolution. In a 2001 Gallup poll, 37% of all Americans agreed with the statement that human beings developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life and that God uh, guided the process. Since 90% of Americans roughly are Christians, that means 96 million American Christians believe in evolution. Now, it's not that that makes it right, but that at least if you're a Christian who wonders whether it's okay to accept the theory of evolution, obviously it's quite okay. In fact, a billion, skept a billion Catholics, who are sometimes skeptics, uh, accept evolution. The Pope himself, John Paul II, in 1996 encyclical, said, New knowledge has led to the recognition that the theory of evolution is more than a hypothesis. It is indeed remarkable that this theory has been progressively accepted by researchers following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge. The convergence, this is an important statement, the convergence, neither sought nor fabricated, this isn't a conspiracy on the part of scientists, it just happened this way, of the results of work that was conducted independently is in itself a significant argument in favor of the theory. I'm going to play this up quite a bit tonight. This convergence from independent lines of inquiry, independent of each other. These guys aren't meeting on the weekends to say, look, we got to get our story straight because that Kent Hovind's out there, uh, you know, uh, st stumping the uh, debate circuit. They arrived at it independently. The Pope, by the way, in 96, is responding to an early, earlier cyclical in the 1950s in which that Pope said, uh, it's possible evolution may be true. We should be open to science and not just reject it. And this Pope said, it is indeed true. In fact, even our Ex-President Jimmy Carter, an evangelical Christian, calls himself a born-again Christian. Uh, when uh, a couple of months ago, the state of Georgia required that textbook, biology textbooks in public high schools have a little sticker in them warning the students about evolution. As a Christian, President Carter said, a trained engineer and a scientist and a professor at Emory University, I'm embarrassed by Superintendent Kathy Cox's attempts to censor and distort the education of Georgia's students. The existing and long-standing use of the word evolution in our state's textbook has not adversely affected Georgians' belief in the omnipotence of God as creator of the universe. There can be no incompatibility between Christian faith and proven facts concerning geology, biology, and astronomy. There's no need to teach that the stars can fall out of the sky and land on a flat earth in order to defend our religious faith. Okay. The problem with all creationist argument, and this is probably the most important slide I'll put up tonight, is that it is nothing more than a God of the gaps argument. That is, wherever there's a gap that scientists seemingly can't explain, or if you can find a quote where it makes it sound like they seemingly can't explain, that must mean that's where the miracle happened. That's where God intervened. Or if you're an intelligent design creationist, you don't use the word God. You use the word id, intelligent designer. Whatever you want to call it, that's where the miracle intervened. It reminds me of Sidney Harris's famous cartoon, my favorite, uh, where the one scientist writes up there in the st step two, then a miracle occurs, and he says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. I can't emphasize enough how important this point is. This is the central point that um, to simply say, look, I don't think you guys can explain this problem, whatever it is. Therefore, that's where a miracle happened. God did it. It did it. Even if that's the case, it doesn't explain anything. 
It just says, poof, a miracle happened. We'll just put a, 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 a filler here, a word filler. We'll say, God did it, it did it, miracle did it, whatever. It doesn't explain anything. Even if uh, Kent Hovain won every single debate he ever did, even if every scientist in America said, you know what, I think God designed the whole thing, and I think, I think biology proves it, it wouldn't change anything with the way science is done. Because this has nothing to do with science. Science is the search for how that happened. What happened in step two? If it did it, don't you want to know how it did it? If God did it, don't you want to know how she did it? <laughs> for example, we know evolution is a very fairly simple thing. It's pattern of descent with modification, whatever causes changes in gene frequency. So if we just take any particular phylogenetic tree, a descent of organisms across time, here's the Ceratopsians. Um, evolutionists, scientists offer an explanation for how this diversity, this biodiversity occurs through genetic frequency changes and, and uh, population genetics and mutations and so on and so forth. Whether that's right or not is a separate question in a way. If it's not right, well then you figure out how it happened. But to simply say, well, well, well God did it or it did it. Well, aren't you curious how it did it? I mean, did it create this general type and then natural selection created all the varieties? Did God create each species and then nature created the subspecies? Did God create the families and then nature created the genus and species? Or did God create every single living single organism one at a time? throughout all of history, or did he set it up at the beginning and then it just sort of ran like a clock and created it? These are interesting questions, but we're never given answers to these because they don't have answers to these things because that's how science is done. Science wants to know how it's done. So evolutionary theory is the best explanation we have for this. It is provisionally true, true with a small t. We're not after, somebody mentioned truth earlier, truth with a capital T doesn't belong in science, it's provisionally true, why? It gives a coherent explanation of what we know. It's conciliant. Independent lines of inquiry jump to the same conclusion. That's that convergence the Pope talked about. Again, it's not that these guys are meeting on the weekends. Ooh, we got to get our story straight. I'm going to say it happened six million years ago. What are you going to say? Seven million years ago, well, Hovind might be in on this. You know, He might find out about this. I'll say 6.5. You say 6.5, and we'll be safe. That's not how it works. And even if it did work that way, if they were that consistent, then I'd be suspicious something was up. In fact, there's always error variance in the estimates given by scientists. Finally, it predicts new findings, which so far have been confirmed. And I'll show you a bunch of these empirically. So for example, there's a consilience on estimating the age of the Earth, right? It's not a perfect number, but there's a little bit of error, error variance there. From independent lines of inquiry, potassium argon dating, radioactive decay dating, Carbon-14 dating, the age of the moon, the age of the solar system, the age of the universe. These are all different scientists that publish in different journals, that go to different conferences, they don't know each other, they don't communicate, they are all arriving at the same kind of sequence of the long evolutionary history of a very old Earth, 4.6 billion years roughly, and a roughly the same age of the moon, slightly less. The age of the universe looks like it's about 13.4 billion years, but this number varies because new data comes in. And so again, you get this, this jumping together, this convergence from different lines of inquiry. And you see that throughout uh, the science of evolution. For example, fossils show intermediate stages, which is what we would predict. So such, for example, the evolution of whales. This is a favorite tactic of creation is show me one transitional fossil, just one transitional fossil. And uh, I remember this particular slide here came out in the journal Science one night. came out the same week I was debating Dwayne Gish. He said, just show me one transitional fossil. So I put this up, and well, here's three. And he said, okay, now we have one, two, three, four gaps in the fossil record. Show me four transitional fossils. <laughs> pretty sneaky, huh? That's pretty good, right? In other words, there's an infinite number of gaps that I will always, as a creationist, demand that you present. There's no amount of evidence you could present that would disconfirm my theory of creation. That's not science, right? That's not how it's done. You can do it, you can call it theology, whatever, it's just not science and we're supposed to be doing science here. You see this also in the evolution of the skulls, uh, whale skulls with Pachycetus 50 million years ago, uh, Adiocetus 25 million years ago, and modern beluga whales. 
common descent, common anatomical structures. You can see the sequence. You can see how the structures change over time. And in fact, there's almost an embarrassment of riches. There are so many fossils. I'm, I'm just staggered that creationists hang on to this, show me just one transitional fossil. There are so many, it's just staggering. This is just a nice little picture of Stephen Jay Gould when he was a very young man at the Harvard Paleontological Collection. These are just fossil, this is just fossil mollusks, right? There's just drawer after drawer after drawer after drawer. Uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I was at Donald Johansson's lab at Arizona State University, the guy who discovered Lucy, I'll show you in a moment. He just had drawer after drawer after drawer of hominids, and we were laying them all out. I took my 12-year-old daughter so she could kind of see all the cool stuff and meet Lucy. She met Lucy. And um, <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Not the Lucy. Yeah, the Lucy. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, and, and I just made a little joke. Yeah, but you don't have any transitional fossils. And, you know, we all had a good laugh because, you know, just table after table is just spread out with these things. There's so many, it's an embarrassment of riches. The, the, the sequence you usually get, and here's a, a problem that most people get into that don't understand the theory of evolution. They see it as this kind of progressive linear ladder, march from small to large, simple to complex, in a line where one leads to another, leads to another, and so on. This is the most famous uh, slide ever done from Time Life. It's been parodied so many times. I've, I have a couple dozen of these slides. I like this one, and in particular this one with homo European unionists <laughs> from the end there. It's a very American uh, characterization, of course. I suppose a new one would have the French crawling on their bellies or something. <laughs> in fact, evolution is a richly branching bush uh, in which we have uh, an evolution from a common ancestor. Of course, you, you know that we didn't come from chimpanzees and gorillas. You say, how, how did we come from them? They're still alive. We didn't come from them. We come from chimps over here, gorillas over here, a common ancestor about 8 million years ago. What's interesting about this slide is that, is that back in the late 60s and early 70s, everybody believed that the common ancestor here was like between 15 and 30 million years old. And Vince Sarich at UC Berkeley, based on early biochemical comparisons across species, said, no, no. I'm predicting that the fossils are going to show that it is, in fact, closer to 7 or 6 or five to six, six to seven million years ago, the common ancestor, and he proved to be right. It took almost 25 years for paleontology to catch up with biochemistry, but here's an example of where these guys are not in some back dark room meeting to get their story straight about the age of things. They conciliate, there's a consilience. It turns out that the fossils match the biochemical and genetic tests. And this, you have this richly branching bush here. Transitional fossils, there's tons of them. It looks more and more like a lot of these different species, such as Sockelanthropus uh, chidensis, six to seven million years ago. This was found in 1991. Australopithecus africanus, three to four million years ago. Australi um, this is Cananthropus um, platyops, which is discovered in 1992, 3.5 million years ago. The famous Lucy, 3.2 million years ago. The, the beauty of Lucy is that you can really, you can sit there and hold in your hand, and, and, you, and, and if you're in Don Johnson's lab, you can. A chimp um, pelvis and hip socket, a Lucy pelvis and hip socket, and a modern one. You can, you can see the beautiful transition there from quadrupedalism to bipedalism. And this is not the only one. Don't think Lucy's the only fossil they got. They got dozens of these australopithecines now. Homo habilis, 1.9 million years ago. Homo georgicus, from Georgia in Russia, 1.8 million years ago, discovered in 92, uh, sorry, 2001. Homo erectus, 1.5 million years ago. Homo neanderthalensis, half a million years ago. Neanderthals and us, we live simultaneously over the last 100,000 years. What happened to those guys? That's them on the right, that's us on the left. What happened to them 30, 40,000 years ago? Gone. Interesting subject, not for tonight, but it's an interesting subject. What happened to those guys? Uh, and most recently, just discovered by Tim White and published last year, Homo sapiens idolatu. It looks like the best evidence we have now, every single one of us from everywhere on the planet comes from a single population of hominids out of Africa. It's these guys, 160,000 years ago. That's the best evidence we have today. This incredible diversity of, of humans we have around the globe all evolved in this relatively short period of time, very rapid changes. Additional tests, we would expect modern organisms to show a variety of structures from simple to complex, reflecting evolutionary history, for example, the eye, 
has evolved numerous times with varying complexity. Um, and again, it's not a single intelligently designed structure that works across the board, which you would expect uh, an all-powerful intelligent designer to create. In fact, what you see are these, these sort of oddities of nature that evolved with whatever was available in the environment, with, with whatever they had to work with. These are eyes have evolved independently dozens of times. In fact, you would also expect biological structures, if evolution were true, to, to show history, not intelligent design, but history. Take our own eye, just take the structure of the retina with the rods and cones on top, uh, amacrine cells, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells, but it's upside down. This is the weirdest thing. It's upside down. The light comes in this direction and doesn't get to the, it, only about 10% of the photons get all the way back to the light sensitive rods and cones. What was Id thinking when he made this thing? Right? I mean, he wasn't thinking because there is no intelligent designer from top down. It's a designer from the bottom up, a tinkerer using with whatever materials are available. We would expect organisms that share most of their DNA to look a lot alike. In fact, they do. And to behave alike. In fact, they do. Chimpanzees are very tribal. You may have noticed from recent uh, current events in politics, we're very tribal, right? There's a whole series of these similarities across species. Is there enough time for evolution to work? You bet. Not only have every, has every human come from a single population out of Africa 160,000 years ago, every single dog alive today comes from a single population of wolves only 15,000 years ago. Of course, this is some part, partly directed evolutionary change, of course, but it shows how rapid uh, DNA sequences can be uh, manipulated. Um, as a test of evolutionary theory, I would love to see um, a creationist just once come up with a fossil bed that shows trilobites and in the same bedding plane, hominids. You never see trilobites with hominids. Now, creationists will say something like, well, there was this hydrodynamic sorting in the flood and all the stupid beasties died and fell through in the flood and drowned early and the smarter ones climbed to the higher hills, something like that. Not one smart trilobite managed to make it up with the hominid. Not one trilobite was in the pocket of the hominid and he managed to survive. Not one. Of course, with evolution, we would predict that this is what you would find, these sequential bedding planes with different fossils in the beds, and that is what you find. But, it, but in any case, it's a testable hypothesis. It's an experiment you can run. Instead of reading creationist literature, go out and start digging. And if you find something like this, that would be the kind of evidence that would overturn the theory of evolution. We also see hom uh, homologies, that is, common anatomical structures due to common ancestry. Most of you have seen these things, the similarity between the whale arm and the human arm. Similarities between uh, whale structures and even hummingbird structures. Similarities um, between our arm and whale arms. If, if Id, God, created the whale flipper, why did he use a mammalian arm structure for it? Why didn't he just make it like a fish flipper? The fish flipper works great. Why have marine mammals swim like this, whereas fish swim like this? Swimming like this is really more efficient. It's a better way. It's the original way. If God created fish this way, why not marine mammals this way? Marine mammals swim this way because that's how land mammals run. That's how their spines move as they propel themselves forward. Vestigial structures are also very telling. For example, we have discovered now a snake, an uh, ancestral snake here, with hind legs. Why would snakes have hind legs? And why would snakes today, as well as whales, show these vestigial legs? These legs are absolutely worthless today. They don't do anything. Why would an intelligent designer design this really clumsy, unintelligent, historical-looking thing, unless you want to impute to God or to Satan that he's just testing our faith by throwing those things in there to see if that'll confuse you with the facts, okay? Other than that, this is a sign of history and evolutionary sequence, not intelligent design. So a fundamental question, then wrapping it up, I think I've got about two minutes here. Is the universe designed? Back in the 18th century when Darwin was studying, the answers were yes by William Paley. 
A watch must have a watchmaker, to which David Hume encountered this old argument. No, actually nature resembles a mindless organism. I think this is not quite right. In fact, I think a better question is the universe naturally or intelligently designed. It's obviously designed to a certain extent, right? But it's, it's historically designed. It looks kind of clumsily designed. So to the answer of, of you know, where did this come from, for, for creationists, they offer a supernatural explanation. Right here, a miracle happened. I think you need to be more explicit in step two there. In a way, this is no different than a Gary Larson cartoon. God makes the snake. Boy, these things are a cinch. I really fail to see, honestly, how this is any different than any creationist argument I have ever heard. A miracle happened. That's it. Naturalism's answer, evolution or descent with modification, of course, is slightly different. We see a sequence, historical sequence. Darwin wasn't the last, but... <laughs> um, okay, so finally then, how do we get these complex structures out of here? Oh, my time is up. All right. Let me just wrap up here, then just one final comment. If humans were designed by God or intelligent designer, this is what we would look like. Instead, and I'll go through the details of that in a second, instead if uh, humans were designed by evolution, this is what the case would be. And as you know, guys, <clears throat> this is the way it is, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Hoven will now give his opening presentation, and after that, will be the rebuttal time, 10 minutes rebuttal, and then 10 minutes rebuttal. So, Dr. Hoven. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. It is an honor to be here in California again. Um, my name is Ken Hoven. I taught high school science 15 years, and now I travel and do seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. This is not my wife. It's just a picture of her. Uh, uh, <laughs> Three kids, got them all married off, and the dog died, so I made it. I'm home free. <laughs> and I have two grandkids, and any, any moment now I'm going to have number three, and then in about five months I have number four, so we're collecting grandkids. I'm a founder of Dinosaur Adventure Land in Pensacola, Florida. It's a science center, theme park, and museum based on creation instead of evolution. We've had thousands of visitors, over 33,000 so far in the first two years we've been open. We teach a lot of classes on science. We are not against science. We have a homeschool, I mean, have a creation boot camp uh, in September teach people how to be a good creationist, to go out and uh, fight against these guys who believe in evolution. So we need more people doing that. My goals are to present the truth and expose error. I'm not against any particular theory. I'm against lies. If you have a theory, great. If you're going to use lies to support it, that's not great. So my goals are to strengthen the faith of believers, to win the loss to Christ, and to win Michael Shermer to Christ. Okay? <laughs> He is not the enemy. He does work for him, but he is not the enemy. Okay. All right. <laughs> let's, uh, let's define a few terms here tonight. Science is knowledge. It comes from the word to know. Okay? Knowledge gained by observations, experimentation, testing, study, etc. Okay? Some try to limit the definition of science like we heard tonight. They want to limit it to the natural world. If it's not natural, it's not science. Okay, well, let's just follow that logic to its logical conclusion. The operation of the world can be understood by scientific discoveries in the world. That does not mean you can explain the origin of the world by looking in the world. Okay, example, the operation of a computer can be understood by science. It, it all takes place in the computer. There's nothing magic about a computer. There's not a little man running around in there changing the numbers on the screen. Okay? It, is a, it is a natural explanation that you can find in the computer for how the computer works. There is not a natural explanation in the computer for how the computer originated. You had to go outside the computer. Somebody outside the computer built the computer, okay? Somebody outside, beyond, uh, above, greater than, smarter than, the computer had to build the computer. 
And just because you can explain the operation of a machine does not mean you can explain the origin of the machine with the same set of rules. So religion is a set of beliefs co co uh, concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. I'm going to define a few positions here. I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. The earth was created in six literal 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago. Now, if that's true, I call our, our ministry creation science evangelism. I think the scientific evidence supports the creation view. A good test for science is does it, give, does it make predictions? Okay, based on the idea that the earth was created in six days, 6,000 years ago, there are some predictions we can make. The Bible says clearly he did it all in six days. Well, let's make a few predictions. I predict the universe will show evidence of order and intelligent design. I predict there will be thousands, if not millions, of symbiotic relationships. All the plants and animals were created within a few days of each other. And there are millions of these that depend on different things for different reasons. Symbiotic relationships, I think, defy an evolutionary explanation. I predict there will be limits to the variations that life forms are able to produce. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind. You may get a big dog or a little dog or a wolf or a coyote or a dog, but you're going to get the same kind of animal. Now, somebody might decide to call it a new species. Okay, I'm not using the word species. It's the same kind of animal. There are limits to the variations. Any farmer that raises anything from corn to cows will tell you there are limits. Sure, there's varieties, but they're limited. Okay? Lots of dogs in the world might have had a common ancestor. A dog. Okay? <laughs> I predict based on, that does not prove dogs came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, by the way. Okay. Uh, I predict there will be a purpose to life. We were designed for a purpose. I think I know what it is. Based on the assumption, we can make some predictions that uh, there will be non-material things in the world like uh, love, sense of justice, mercy, innate knowledge of right and wrong, a conscience, and absolute truth. Those things can be found. They do exist. I predict there'll be a way to find the will of the Creator, such as messengers speaking for Him, or maybe even a book telling us how He created it and why. I predict there'll be an afterlife where we face the, the Creator to give an accounting for everything we've ever said or thought or done. That's going to be a fearful day. Then I believe, before the flood came, the Bible teaches people lived over 900 years. That's what the Bible says. 912 is the average age from those before the flood. I believe that. Now, what predictions can we make based on that teaching? Well, I predict there will be uh, legends of a creation event in cultures all over the world. I predict there will be a golden age legend where people uh, lived a long time. And it's interesting. Almost all ancient cultures have stories about what they called the golden age, when people lived to be nearly a 1,000. I predict there will be skeletons found showing people with signs of great age, such as bigger brow ridge or bigger jaws, I predict there will be biological problems today, like wisdom teeth for 40 or 50% of the population, indicating man used to be bigger and now we're smaller. So wisdom teeth are getting crowded into the jaw, and in some people they can't make it in. I predict since we are a copy off 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 a copy of the original, there are likely to be a few biological problems with this generation. But that's, that's no reflection on the original. The fact that this, this gene code has been copied and copied and copied and copied and copied from Adam, is, it's amazing we can sit here and talk about it. Okay? It must have been really good in the original. I predict there will be a universal longing for things to be restored to the Garden of Eden. And that's what we find every place. Just about every culture has some kind of legend or story about a heaven where you get to go. Now, what difference does it make if you believe in creation or evolution? Well, if evolution is true, how do we tell right from wrong? Where's the standard? How do we tell right from wrong? Do we decide right from wrong based on what Osama bin Laden thinks? Should we decide right from wrong based on what Bill Clinton thinks? Should we decide right from wrong based on what the majority thinks? How is there, is there a standard someplace? How do we tell right from wrong if evolution is true? Now, if evolution is true, death brought man into the world, and death is a wonderful thing. Death is the hero of the plot. See, in order for evolution to work, one animal has to evolve a little better than the rest. The rest of them have to die or else that new improved gene gets swamped in the population. doesn't do anything. Death is the ultimate hero of the plot for evolution. The Bible teaches clearly that man brought death into the world. By one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. Since by man came death. The Bible talks about man destroyed God's creation. I predict, according to the Bible, I read the Bible, it says there was a flood, a completely worldwide universal flood that destroyed the world 4,400 years ago and dropped everybody's property value to zero. <laughs> Based on that belief, I can make a few predictions. I predict there will be hundreds of layers of strata, rock layers and mud layers, strata, sometimes continent-wide layers of strata. I predict there will be billions of fossils, including coal and oil, found in those layers. I predict there will be huge canyons and deltas showing evidence of rapid erosion because of the flood teaching. 
I predict there'll be uh, legends of this worldwide flood found in cultures all over the world. And sure enough, there are nearly 300 of these flood legends found from around the world. I predict there'll be petrified trees in the vertical position running through many of these layers. And sure enough, there are thousands of them. And here we have people trying to teach you that each of these layers is a different age. Would you please explain to me how we get a tree petrified connecting all these layers? <laughs> I don't know how long dead trees stand up around here in California before they fall down, but in Florida you get maybe five or six years. If you're going to have a tree stand there for millions of years while the layers form around it, I'd like to see that, okay? Anybody telling you those layers are different ages has, has a problem in his thinking, okay? Now, I like science. I'm not against science. And I, I do resent, though, people trying to assume that evolution is part of science. Evolution is not part of science. Evolution is a religion. It's mixed in with science, I understand. But that doesn't make it part of science. Beer is often sold at football games. Beer has nothing to do with football, and beer does not become athletic by association with football, okay? <laughs> so, an evolution does not become science because it's stirred into a science book, okay? Evolution's a religion. Now, let's define a few terms. The word evolution has at least six different meanings or levels or stages. First, it would have to be cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter. Secondly, it would have to be chemical evolution. According to the Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang produced hydrogen. Okay, then how did we get all these elements? Do you want me to believe that uranium evolved from hydrogen? They say, oh yeah, fusion happens in, you know, in stars. Well, you've got two problems now. Number one, you can't fuse past iron. Number two, you've got a chicken and an egg problem. Did the, did the elements come before the stars? To, to see, the, star, the elements make up the stars, and the stars make up the elephants. Which one came first? They've got a real chicken and an egg problem when it comes to chemical evolution. Thirdly, there'd have to be stellar evolution. Somehow the stars have to evolve. We've never seen one form. We see stars blow up all the time, called novas or supernovas. And yet there's enough stars out there that are now known. The current last estimate was 70 sextillion stars in the universe that we've observed, which means about 11 trillion per person. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. Okay? <laughs> Fourthly, there's going to have to be organic evolution, the origin of life. Somehow life has to get started from non-living material. The evolutionist is still left 200 years behind the times in science. They still believe non-living material can spontaneously generate. That's been proven wrong several hundred years ago. Francisco Reddy, Louis Pasteur. Now, if you want to believe that, that's fine. I don't care what you believe, but don't call it science. They'll say, I read Dr. Shermer's book about, oh, they're doing experiments now, trying to do these. Okay, well, you do all the experiments you want, but meanwhile, it hasn't been done, okay? Nobody's made life. And if a bunch of intelligent people do get together and make life, that would prove it takes intelligence to make life. <laughs> uh, duh, okay? Number five, we have what's called macroevolution. That's where you change from one kind of animal to another. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Now, if you want to believe a dog came from a non-dog, you believe whatever you want, but don't call it science, number one, and don't make me pay to teach it to all the kids in school like it's science. That's your religion. You teach that in a private school at your expense, okay? Number six, we have what's called microevolution. I object to the term. I think it's a lousy term, but they use it, so I'll explain it. Microevolution tells us there are variations within the kinds. Big dogs, little dogs, straight hair, curly hair, I agree, that happens. The first five, though, are purely religious. Nobody's ever observed any of these. So when I talk about evolution tonight, I am not talking about variations within the kind. Speciation, I'm not talking about that. I'm not sure who's deciding when we have a new species anyway. Somebody decided a dog and a wolf are different species. Okay, but a five-year-old knows they're the same kind of animal. Okay, a horse and a zebra are different species, but they're still the same kind of animal. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery. Okay. <laughs> so, evolution theory teaches 20 billion years ago, or sometime in the past like that, there was a big bang where nothing exploded. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. And then it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. This is what the books teach. Okay, that's the big bang theory. 18 or 20 billion years ago, big bang. 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. Earth, planet Earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. This is what all the textbooks teach, okay? Then as the Earth formed, it was hot and it was large pools of bubbling lava, but it slowly cooled down. And then, boys and girls, millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. This guy said the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So their theory would say 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And so there's Grandpa right there. Okay. <laughs> now, 
There's no question there's a wide variety of dogs in the world. The question is, does that variation we see tell us there's an infinite, there is infinite varieties available? No. I don't think the dogs came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago. Okay. So the first five are purely religious. Number six is science. But they try to skip the first four all the time. I see this all the time in textbooks. They try to skip those. Now, evolution, number five, the first five anyway, I think is the dumbest and most dangerous idea in the history of the world. It didn't happen. There's no evidence for it. Um, let's see. Marxism, uh, evolution leads straight to Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, abortion, communism, Marxism, rejection of logic, and to hell if you don't trust Christ. Okay. <laughs> now, Michael Shermer is the editor of Skeptic Magazine. Uh, he, ha he is absolutely correct to be skeptical of some of the dumb things people believe out there. There are some weirdos in this world, folks, okay? you got some here in California. And they believe some strange things. And I think what he does exposing the... the, the Illogical stuff that people teach is great. I wish he would apply that same logic to his own theory of evolution. He is skeptical of everything except the evolution theory. For some reason, he's not skeptical of that. That blows my mind. Now, let's define some terms. In the Skeptic Magazine uh, uh, article here, Michael Shermer wrote, uh, August 28, 2003, Brights come out of the closet. As many of you are aware, of, if you're aware, there's a movement to introduce a new Mimi, a new name for our society, our, our, our group, the evolutionists. Instead of calling us non-believers, infidels, heretics, skeptics, humanists, secular humanists, introducing, introduced at the Atheist Alliance International Conference last year in Florida, they came up across the idea to call themselves the Brights. We are the Brights. Then he goes through the illustration in his book about how that the gays, you know, picked that term gay so people wouldn't call them queers or fags or something else. And it's, now it's a, it's a better term and they've got, now gotten political clout because of the less abres, uh, aggressive term. Okay. What is a Bright? He says, uh, a Bright is a person whose worldview is naturalistic. Now, well, let's define some terms. He says, bright is a good word. I mean cheerful and lively, showing an ability to think, to learn. That's good. But now I'm officially out of the other closet in print. He's a bright. Okay. Well, the word, people used to be called homo sapiens. In the most recent books, they're calling us homo sapiens sapien. The word sapien means wise. We're the wise, wise man. We're bright. Well, the Bible says that professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. <laughs> okay. And if you think your great, 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 great grandpa was a rock, I think you're a fool. Okay? Well, we can help you, though. We're here to help. Let's define some terms. <laughs> stupid. Lacking normal intelligence. Foolish. Silly. A stupid idea. Evolution is not even a good theory. It is stupid. Okay? People are welcome to believe whatever they want, but I think it ought to be illegal. It's certainly uh, silly and unfair to make all taxpayers deport this one religion in our public school system. And evolution is nothing but a religion. Okay. Uh, in his magazine, he said, my real purpose was to understand Gish and the creationists so that I can understand how they can reject the well-confirmed theory called evolution. Well, Michael, we're not rejecting science. We're rejecting the idea that you're stretching this observation of, you know, varieties of dogs to mean a dog came from a rock. We aren't, we aren't rejecting science. And evolution is not a well-confirmed theory. You've got to define what you're talking about here. Now, I'm not anti-evolution. I'm not an evolution denier, like he says in his book oh, numerous times. I'm for truth and against error. If evidence exists for a theory, show me. But don't use lies to support a theory. By the way, Kent is Welsh for bright. Okay? <laughs> Just a little bit of trivia there. Texas has laws uh, requiring textbooks to be accurate. So does Florida. So does Wisconsin. So does Alabama. So does California. Fact textbooks shall be factually accurate. That's all I want is accuracy in textbooks, okay? Minnesota says a teacher shall not deliberately suppress or distort subject matter. Evolution is a dying religion surviving only on tax dollars. It's dead, folks. It didn't happen. Now, the evolution theory is positively anti-science. There's not a shred of real evidence to support the theory other than oft-repeated lies. Now, if you have evidence for evolution, I really want to see it. But I heard some things in the last 25 minutes that uh, Dr. Schirmer said that he ought to know, I'm sure he knows, are simply lies. They've been proven wrong years ago. The idea of vestigial structures. Here's the evidence they use for evolution. they got pages and pages of this stuff. This guy says, evolution's a fact, not theory. Well, he, he, that's a mantra. They say that over and over and over, and pretty soon students start to believe it. Well, it's a fact. I heard it, I heard it in school over and over. It's got to be true. <laughs> What do you mean by evolution, first of all? If you mean we all came from Iraq, no, that's not a fact. 
If you mean dogs and wolves have a common ancestor, I would agree with that. That would be a fact. That's why I have to define the term. So here's some of the evidence they use in textbooks to support their theory. If I had a theory that the moon is made of green cheese, that's a dumb theory, but there is no law against dumb theories, fortunately, okay? <laughs> but then suppose I said NASA proved it when they went there in 1973 on a secret mission and found the moon is made of green cheese. Well, now, see, it's okay to have a dumb theory, but it's wrong to lie about my evidence just to get people to believe me. And I think it's real seriously wrong to accept tax dollars to get paid while I lie to support my theory. And that's what happens in this university, okay? They say, we've got evidence from fossils. I heard that several times when Dr. Shermer was speaking. Fossils. Now, think, stop and think about it. No fossil, no fossil could possibly count as evidence for evolution. No fossils count. You can't prove those bones had any kids, let alone different kids. And he talked about drawers after drawers of all these mollusks at Harvard. Well, that's wonderful. None of them show any evolution, though. What they show is drawers after drawers after drawers of dead things proving a flood in the days of Noah. Now, evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. Number one, they assume mutations will make something new and better. And number two, natural selection will make it survive and take over the population. By the way, evolution is a religion of death. That's how things get ahead. Things have to die. It's true mutations happen, but they don't cause any evolution. Darwin said, it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Darwin observed 14 kinds of finches on the Galapagos Islands, and he correctly concluded they had a common ancestor, a bird. But then he incorrectly concluded that that was enough evidence to prove that birds are related to bananas which is what he says in his book right here, and what Dr. Shermer believes, and what some of you believe. Now, if you want to believe birds are related to bananas, I don't care what you believe, but don't call it science. Admit it's a religion, and go start yourself a private school and teach anybody else that wants to come pay and learn it, okay? But get it out of the tax-funded school system. It's a lie. There's no proof any animals are related to different kinds of animals, okay? Mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. Anybody that studies the subject will tell you that. Mutations scramble information that's already existing. Here's a five-legged bull. There's no new information added. A short-legged sheep, again, no new information. It's a loss of information. There's a two-headed turtle. That's a mutant. It's not ninja, but he's mutant. <laughs> he's going to freeze first winter because nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. Okay? No. Uh, scrambling up existing gene code will not give you something totally new. That's all mutations do is scramble up things. This textbook says, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Watch what it says now. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Uh, excuse me? Why don't they give an example of a beneficial mutation? Why did they show us a bad one? And there are millions of those. Happen all the time. But they told us that good ones is how it works. Show me a good one. You know why they didn't show us a good mutation? Nobody's ever seen one. One guy said, oh, yeah, people in Africa that get sickle cell anemia are less likely to get malaria. Oh, that's brilliant. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both sickle cell and malaria are negative. You think that process is going to turn a rock to a human in 4.6 billion years? Is that, that's the one they always bring out. Well, if you think that's going to do it, I, I, I admire your faith. I don't admire your intelligence, but I do admire your faith, okay? Natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. It's a selection process. Creation is thought of it first. Natural selection is not a creative force. It can't create anything. It selects. That's all it does. It can't create a thing, okay? If you worked in a factory that produced cars and your job was to select the good ones to go through and select the bad ones to go out, be fixed or, you know, scrapped, how long would it take that selection process of get, letting good cars through to change the car to an airplane? It'll never happen. See, the sele natural selection is never going to change the animal to something else. It's just going to make sure you get a good species of whatever it is, whether it's cows or corn, okay? You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you get a dog every single time. And I have five-year-olds. When I do this test, almost always they get it. I'll say, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> yeah, the banana. The Bible says they bring forth after their kind, not species, kind. Okay, and that's all we've ever observed. Variations happen, but they have limits. Farmers have been trying to get bigger pigs for a long time, but they'll never get a pig as big as Texas. Roaches become resistant to pesticides, but they will never become resistant to a sledgehammer. Okay? 
They always still produce the same kind of plant or animal. No new information is created. It's always scrambling existing information. That's all we observe. Now, science is what we can see and study and test. If you want to believe it goes beyond that, that's fine. I don't care what you believe, but it's not science. No new information is added, okay? The gene pool of the new variety is always more limited. They can take a, a herd of dogs or a flock of dogs or whatever you want to call them and, and select the gene code to get a little tiny dog or a great big dog. They have the genetic variety in the original gene code. You can s select for a slice of the gene code and get a particular trait that you want, okay? Long tail feathers on a bird. Can't fly anymore, but you get really long tail feathers. Okay, good. But you didn't create anything. You selected part of the gene pool that was already existing. Somebody kept breeding dogs till they got a chihuahua. All that time and money to make a dog that is 100% useless. <laughs> How long would the chihuahuas last in the real world? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, go ahead, make my day. All right. yeah. <laughs> genetic information is lost, it's not added. There's no new, real evolution would require an increase in genetic complexity. You gotta take the gene pool of a rock, which is nothing, and develop the gene pool of every living thing on earth today. Talk about a genetic bottleneck. Take a look at the gene code of a rock sometime, okay? There's a lot of kinds of corn in the world, okay? They probably had a common ancestor. Corn. You never get a hamster or a tomato or whale to grow on your corn stalk, though, okay? <laughs> sure, there's a lot of varieties out there. They call it divergent evolution. Oh, it's not divergent evolution. It's still a dog, okay? They show the kids five kinds of dogs and say, oh, see, that's divergent evolution. No, it's a variety of dog. It's proof what the Bible says. They bring forth after their kind. There's a lot of varieties of horses out there, big horses and little horses. We had the world's smallest horse visit our museum. My granddaughter liked riding it, I guess, but uh, they crossbreed horses. They get Zorses, Zonkeys, Zionis, Zedonks, and Shebras. <laughs> they crossbreed all every which way because they're the same kind of animal. There's a herd of zebroids running around. So there's no question there's a lot of variation available. The question is, does it go any farther? Now, if Dr. Shermer wants to believe this variation we observe, which is science, can be extended, extrapolated to mean Infinite variation, he's welcome to believe that, but he just left science. And why he's not skeptical of his own belief, I don't understand. He's skeptical of a lot of things he ought to be skeptical of. Turn your, turn your focus on your own belief, Mike. I want, to, I want to help you here. That's what I'm here for, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Had a little report of some people behaving badly. Let's respect our neighbors and enjoy the debate. Dr. Shermer will have 10 minutes for rebutting what Dr. Hovind just taught. Wow. You're the only guy I can't I know and give a two hour lecture in 25 minutes. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have had that beer before. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> but I'm having a good time. <laughs> All right. He brought the beer up. I, uh... Okay, so um, Ken Hovind has announced at the beginning that his purpose here is to win over non-believers to Christ and, and me. Uh, I even made the slide. I was impressed. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and he even got my name right. I was in South Dakota uh, two nights ago, and a guy was passing out literature about why people shouldn't believe my lecture. <laughs> and he said, uh, Michael Sherman is going to tell you things you shouldn't believe. I said, well, okay, where is this guy? <laughs> anyway, it's Shermer. Any rate, um, I was actually once an evangelical, born-again Christian. I was. I accepted Christ in 1971, and I went to Pepperdine University to major in theology. And I took this very seriously. I was um, really, really a believer. I did. I, and, and, and by evan evangelical, evangelical, I mean we evangelized. We went door to door. This was literally Amway with Bibles. You know, we were selling God. That's what, how you define an evangelical Christian. And uh, I went door to door and told people about this stuff. And then, for, for long story short, I wrote a whole book about this stuff. But um, I found out you had to, to get a PhD in theology, you had to study uh, Greek. Latin, Hebrew, and Aramaic, and I could barely get through Spanish, so I thought, all right, I'm going to have to switch majors here. <laughs> get a job, so I switched to the sciences, because I was good at math and science. And I discovered there that the answers are not final. They are provisional. They're provisionally true. This is what we know now. Furthermore, it might change. 
And that's okay. Really, it's okay. In fact, it's a good thing. And best of all, you get to participate in the process. And I thought, wow, what a great deal. I get to think. I actually have to think for myself. I get to try to find out some of the answers. The answers aren't out there for me to just read from some other authority, but I actually have to try to think it through myself, for me, at least personally. And religion is the most personal of beliefs. Um, that was far more enlightening and transcendent, spiritual, uh, than anything I had experienced in seven years of being a born-again Christian. And uh, even today, even though I've been to Chartres Cathedral in France, it's one of the most spiritual places you can go on earth. But uh, it, to me, to stand in the 100-inch telescope dome at the top of Mount Wilson is equally, if not more, spiritual. So science has, at least the discoveries of science, science isn't a religion, but the discoveries can be felt in a transcendent way. So I don't really see that there's any conflict here. You don't have to pick between the two. Now, in terms of what religion does, right, it does things that science doesn't do for the most part. And so, again, even if it turned out every scientist on the planet was religious, believed in God, was an evangelical Christian, take your pick, uh, it wouldn't change what they do when they're doing science. Right? They would still have to, have, to, have to go to work the next day and, and do science. Science has nothing to do with religion. Um, in terms of some other claims here. Um, oh, uh, uh, Dr. Hoven asked about my position on the afterlife. Um, well, I'm for it. <laughs> really? <laughs> I am. I hope it's true. And if it's there, I hope I'm going. Don't you? I mean, right? This would be great. But what I want to be true and what is actually true are two different things, and that's the problem with religious faith, is that you don't know if it's actually true. It's true for you, true psychologically, which is fine for a lot of things, but that's not science. A lot of things are like that. Politics are like that. A lot of social attitudes are like that. But that's not science. It's just something completely different. I can't say that the Bible is literally true. Really? Gosh, in Genesis, the first chapter, uh, Adam and Eve are created at the same time. In the second chapter, Adam's created first. Then some other things happen. He names the animals. He gets a little lonely. He wants to be, you know, the next Bachelor re re reality show. He says to God, you know, I need a companion. God says, okay, I'll take that extra rib, and here's your companion. All right, so, you know, of course, obviously, the Bible's not literally true. We have two creation stories. They can't literally be true. And, of course, thoughtful theologians say, well, of course, they're not literally true. These are two different explanations of the same phenomena. Fine, but it's not literally true. And in any case, um, Kent mentioned uh, good and evil, morality. Where is the standards for right and wrong if evolution's true, if there is no God? Uh, where do we get these right and wrongs? Well, if we're supposed to take the Bible literally, and since gay marriages is a hot topic these days, you, you've heard all about uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, where it says a man shall not lie with another man. All right? Okay, but literally, if we're supposed to really turn to this as our source of morality, what about the next chapter where disobedient children are supposed to be stoned to death? Oh, well, you know, we don't accept that today, you know, because we're more enlightened. Really? I thought it was literally true. I thought all of it was true. What about the next chapter in which uh, women, when you marry, if you do not show the signs of your virginity on the sheets the next morning after your honeymoon night, you are to be taken to the elders and stoned to death. That's in there. You can't believe this stuff is in there. <laughs> if you actually read this Old Testament, you're wow, this is incredible. This is in the Bible? Yeah, it is. So if you're supposed to take it literally, what do you make of that stuff. Of course, there's myths and legends from all cultures. Some of them are similar because it turns out all cultures that live on bodies of water that flood have flood myths. Cultures that don't live on bodies of water don't have flood myths. These are ge geographically determined. Now, uh, Kent said that Evolution's a religion. Look, if evolution is a religion, everything's a religion, then nothing's a religion. Religion, as a word, has to mean something. If you say that evolution's a religion, it, it doesn't mean anything. 
Evolution is not a worldview in the sense of offering moral homilies and purpose and meaning in life. You as a person who takes a scientific worldview like me, you may construct your own personal meanings and purpose and discover your own right and wrongs through a variety of ways. I wrote a book about this called The Science of Good and Evil, but the, the actual science of evolution has nothing to do with any of that. The people that do evolutionary biology, they don't do morality and theology and God and what's the purpose and meaning of my life when they're doing science. These are two different things. Turns out 39% of all American scientists believe in God. So how do, how do they do this if, according to him, they can't be doing this? Well, they do. How do they do that? All right? So these are two different things. In terms of the science of cosmic evolution, where the Big Bang come from, and so on and so forth, these are, you know, big subjects. A lot of data, an incredible a lot of data. When I was in college, the Big Bang was not accepted. It was kind of a toss-up between the Big Bang and the steady state and so on. Finally, so much evidence came forth that hardly anybody supported the steady state theory. Now pretty much everybody supports the Big Bang. Not because they have to or else they're going to have to become Christians or something. It has nothing to do with religion. They are simply concluding that because there's so much data in support of it. Despite of all the skeptics over the decades that said we don't believe the Big Bang, finally they were all converted to so-called believers in the Big Bang simply because there was so much evidence for it. Um, I'm always amused when Creationists bring up this evolution leads to communism, leads to abortion, leads to atheism and sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and rape, and nastiness, and so on. Uh, I can assure you, if you study history at all, long before Darwin, people were nasty to one another, and they had wars, and rape was uh, not uncommon, and thieves, and so on and so forth, criminals. There's nothing new about people doing nasty things to one another. That's what we do. It's part of our nature. We're also nice to one another, but it has nothing to do with a particular theory. And as for it being taught in public schools, well, that's a political issue, whether schools should be public or all private or what should be taught. What gets taught is, in fact, whatever is accepted uh, amongst the experts. The experts accept the theory of evolution simply because the evidence is so overwhelming. As for the brights, I don't call myself a bright. Mainly because I guess the natural imp imp implication is if you weren't a bright, you'd be a dim. And uh, well, let his own definitions that he put up uh, account for that. Bible's telling us that people are fools who don't believe, so I guess you're calling me a fool. Uh, okay, uh, if that's what you think, that's fine. Finally, um, as for... Um, Increase in information in the genome and so on. We have so many examples of this. It's incredible. Lots of examples of gene duplication, chromosomal aberrations that lead to increases in complexity across various organisms. And uh, I'll tell you more about that in my final four minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Nope. Now Dr. Hoven. Dr. Hoven will give uh, 10 minutes of rebuttal to the opening comments by Dr. Shermer. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'd like to comment on several things uh, that he said. He mentioned there is uh, evidence for evolution from homology, from vestigial structures, the human eyes of poor design. Uh, I can't, don't think I'll be able to cover all that, but you can get my video series on my website, drdino.com, and watch the whole thing. This textbook says the appendix is vestigial. This is ludicrous, okay? This is a lie. The appendix is not vestigial. You do need your appendix, okay? The appendix is part of your immune system. It's true you can live without it. You can also live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes. That doesn't prove you don't need them, okay? If your appendix is taken out, you have a much better chance of getting quite a few diseases, and something else in the immune system has to work harder. It's like losing a finger. You can still have a grip, but now the rest of the fingers have to work harder. If somebody tells you the appendix is vestigial, they are either confused about their anatomy or they're lying to you, but it's not true. This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. This is one that he brought up earlier about the whale having a vestigial pelvis. Now, hold on a minute. Uh, National Center for Science Education, funded by Andrew Carnegie's grant, for, he loved the evolution theory, the National Center for Science Education, who all of them refused to debate me two weeks ago when I was at Berkeley, um, they teach the people that cows evolved to whales, bossy to blowhole. 
Hmm. Well, here's their evidence. Whales have a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. Just imagine the uh, hind limb bones that have no function, the textbook says. Imagine whales walking around. It's true. Here's the bones they're talking about right there. You can see them at your Los Angeles Museum right down the road here. Those are the bones. Yes, just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> this textbook says the whale's pelvis is located far from the vertebra and has no apparent function. Hmm. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. This is a lie. Those bones are anchor points that special muscles attach to. And without those special bones and those special muscles, the whales cannot reproduce. Male and female, whales have different bones in that region for to support different muscles for different reasons. This has nothing to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting baby whales. Okay? So the people that are writing this in the textbooks are either ignorant of whale anatomy or they're lying trying to push their theory. I hope they're just ignorant. That we can fix. If they're lying, they ought to get a different job picking features or changing tires. They got no business taking tax dollars to lie to the kids coming through their class. It says, these bones resemble those of other mammals, but they are weakly developed in the whale and have no apparent function. This is a college biology book. This guy ought to be fired. He doesn't understand his whale anatomy. They're teaching this stuff like it's some kind of fact. Is this a university to get educated or are you just getting indoctrinated in a theory? Okay. They say ambulocetus, pictured here, is mostly imagination. The dark bones are the only ones actually found. Ambulocetus is not a, a missing link. Ambulocetus is just a few fragments of bone. How about a, a, a B.J. Stahl, vertebrate history, uh, Dover publisher, said the Basilosaurus is not an intermediate. He said uh, the archaeocetes uh, could not possibly have been ancestral to any of the modern whales. Pachycetus, shown here, all they found was one piece of a skull, a small piece of jaw, and a few teeth. That's enough to know it used to be a whale? You've got to be kidding. Now, here you are, Skeptic Magazine. Why aren't you skeptical of a claim like that? No pelvic bones were found, and little is known about the tail, but the authors are certain the feet were enormous. <laughs> As such, Ambulocetus re represents a critical intermediate. This is pure propaganda, okay? We could talk all day about the whale anatomy. He mentioned about the snake. I happen to have a 15 and a half foot python snake skin in my museum in Pensacola, Florida. If you look at the south end of that python, you will see it has two little bitty claws. Those claws are attached to little tiny bones going up inside the snake's body. That's a fact, okay? They have them. The textbook says these are rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. He mentioned that earlier, that the snake uh, pelvis is evidence for evolution. Look. Those little claws and those little bones have nothing to do with walking on land. The snakes use those claws in mating, okay? They don't have any arms, right? And they can't talk. <laughs> they can't talk and say, screw it over, honey, okay? This has nothing to do with walking on land. So the people that are saying the snake has a vestigial leg are ignorant of snake anatomy or are lying trying to push a theory off. Okay, but it's not true. They use those bones and those little muscles. This textbook says humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. It says the vestigial tailbone in humans is homologous to the functional tail of other primates. Thus, vestigial structures can be viewed as evidence for evolution. You can rewind the tape and see that's what he said in his opening comments. One of the evidences for evolution is vestigial structures. I would like to point out, Your Honor, vestigial structures is losing something, not gaining something. How can that be evidence for evolution? How did you get it to begin with? Secondly, the tailbone is not vestigial. One guy told me, he said, up at Berkeley, he said, I think the tailbone is vestigial. I said, well, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. Get your Gray's anatomy. Now, if you believe the tailbone is vestigial, then I will pay to have yours removed. Okay? <laughs> Bend over. This textbook says the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function. It is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. Either these authors are ignorant of anatomy or they're lying. I don't see another option. Okay? If you know of one, please let me know. But it's not true that they're vestigial. And even if there were vestigial structures, that is the opposite. He mentioned that the human eye is poor design because the blood vessels are in front of the rods and cones. Well. The fact of the matter is, we live in the air, okay? Air is a poor insulator for UV light. Your body's last defense against ultraviolet light is a layer of blood vessels in front of the retina to protect the rods and cones from UV light. Some people say octopus, one atheist I debated in New York, said octopus have a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. 
Ours are wired backwards. It's poor design. I said, well, sir, uh, octopus live in the water. <laughs> okay? Water blocks UV light. They don't need their blood vessels in front. So if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just go ahead, but you're going to be blind in a few days. We're designed for living in the air, and they're designed for living in the water. And I think the eye is incredibly designed. At 51, mine are starting to fade a little bit, but hey, that's expected, okay? That's an example we used to be much better. Things are getting worse. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Things are falling apart. Um, let's see. He mentioned that uh, he, when he got through Pepperdine, he went to, off to graduate school and decided he got to think. To me, that implies that if you don't believe in evolution, you, you're not thinking. I happen to resent that. I happen to think a lot, and, and I enjoy thinking, and I enjoy the, the object of, uh, of, I enjoy science. I like studying. I think what happens, though, is you get to get indoctrinated when you come to a university like this. You get to be told what to believe. You don't really get to think. Because if you wrote a paper, suppose a teacher stood up 10 years ago in the Soviet Union, where my daughter-in-law is from. A teacher gets up in class and says, hey, uh, students, I don't believe in communism anymore. Capitalism is a much better system. What, what would happen? That teacher would be shoveling snow in Siberia if they survived. And if a teacher gets up in this university tomorrow or Monday and says, kids, I don't believe in evolution anymore, I think creation is true. They will go to academic Siberia. There have been hundreds of teachers fired lost their jobs, lost their government grants, precisely because they didn't bow down and kiss the feet of the sacred cow of evolution. Evolution's a religion, nothing more. There's no scientific evidence to back it up. If you think there is some, I really, really would like to see it. He mentioned that the Pope accepts evolution. That's because the Pope has never been to my seminar. <laughs> And I don't care what the Pope believes on any subject, okay? Okay, what does the Bible say? And what does science teach us? He mentioned in his opening comments that answers in Genesis, Ken Ham disagrees with me on most subjects. That is absolutely not true. I know Ken Ham well. I've uh, met, met with him several times, talked to him numerous times. He and I disagree on a couple of little things. We agree on 99% of the things, and on the other 1%, he's wrong, I'm right, but it's real simple. Okay? <laughs> But I sell his books and support his ministry, and I, I think you're simply wrong if you think there's, there's a vast disagreement there. Just little minor stuff that doesn't amount to nothing. Uh, he said, this argument's only going on in America and New Zealand. Well, that's not true, first of all. I've spoken in, let's see, 32 countries now. This argument's going on every place. There are creationist organizations all over the place. And even if it was only going on in America, it still does, that's, that's no evidence for one side or the other. The argument ought to be going on everywhere. And I'm thrilled this university would allow something like this to happen. I wonder how many teachers they have, how many courses do they offer here on biblical creationism, just to give the, give the kids the other side. Go check your library. You'll find thousands of books about evolution. I bet you won't find five on creation from the creation perspective. You may find some evolutionist wrote a book about creation, blasting it for some reason. Go Folks, is this an education to get, do you get educated or do you get indoctrinated in places like this? I just, I'm sick and tired of them lying to support their theory. Don't tell me about the vestigial structures. What evidence do you have to show us evolution? Not homology. Similar bone structures in the arms they mentioned earlier. Yeah, that proves a common designer. The Honda Prelude and the Honda Accord have quite a few interchangeable parts. <laughs> Doesn't prove they both came from a skateboard. They have a common designer, okay? <laughs> so all the evidence I've seen he's presented tonight is either mistaken or can be interpreted for creation. So I, I stand my ground. I still believe the Bible's right. Thank you. Okay, we're now to the closing arguments where each man gets four minutes. And get your questions ready. What I think would work well is at the end of uh, Dr. Hovind's closing comments to pass them into the aisle and someone will get them and then we'll take a, a five minute break and do question and answer. So get your questions written and start the closing argument. And then we throw the chairs. <laughs> uh, okay, good. I only get four minutes. Okay, so um, this is an important concept to understand about um, explaining how things evolved. Th th this was put forth in Darwin's time. What is called the problem of incipient stages. What good is half of a wing? 
You can certainly see what a fully developed wing is. What's the functional pathway to get to the end if by Darwinian evolution you have to go step by step gradually? Well, the answer is, is that it didn't come out with that end purpose in mind because evolution doesn't look ahead. In fact, each of these particular structures had some other function along the way. In the end, then they end up with a final function which is different than the specific functions for each of those structures. So for example, legs, obviously, their primary purpose is for walking. If they can also serve for grabbing your honey during lovemaking, well, then that's also a fine. But that's a secondary function for which they were adopted for later uses. And, and who could disagree with that? <laughs> and so let's say that the legs in snakes become a functional later. It costs a lot of energy to support the structure, blood vessels, nerves, and so on to run legs. So it's simply more efficient to lose them and still use them for a secondary function later along the way, such as mating. Okay, So that's how that happens. This explains a lot of things. There's a lot of good research on that. Um, in closing, the naturalistic way of explaining how the world works is used because it works. It gives us something to do when we're doing science. Doing supernaturalism, which is what Ken Hovind does and most creationists do, doesn't do anything. It doesn't give you anything. Again, all you've heard tonight are, I can't figure out how the evolutionists uh, can explain this. I disagree with it. I don't think they've come up with an answer. Therefore, God did it. That's not an answer. That doesn't give us anything to do if you're going to do science. If you want to say, look, this, this is important to me because I happen to believe in my religion, I need to believe this particular tenet that the Bible is literally true. That's fine, but that's not science. The reason I told you that other people don't accept that is simply to show that that's not a particularly popular view. In fact, I think it's a, a fairly narrow view. The reason people believe in God, and I wrote a book on this, is primarily having to do with emotional, psychological, cultural, social, family reasons. The number one predictor of anybody's uh, religiosity is their parents' religiosity, where they were born and what their influences were. And then peer groups, teachers, and so on. It has nothing to do with, boy, I lined up the evidence and I saw it was true and therefore I believed it. Almost nobody arrives at their beliefs for that reason. Same thing with political and social attitudes. Scientists, of course, are people and they're biased as well, but science has a really important built-in self-correcting machinery that drives it toward error correction and the elimination of bias. At least it's better than any other social system, as flawed as it may be. Science is not a religion. It's not even a noun. It's not a thing. It's a way of asking questions and answering them about the natural world. It's not anything more than that. It's not religion. It's a way of thinking. It's a verb. Think of science as a way to approach the world and answer claims and test answers and test questions and so on. In that sense, science is the best thing ever developed for understanding how the world works. Thank you. Okay, we have a new idea on the questions. Uh, when Dr. Hovind is done with his closing arguments, pass them to the aisle, and the people at the end of the aisles, pass them down. So, uh, the aisles are jam-packed. Like you said, there's no fire marshal here. <laughs> Good thing. But do that when uh, he wraps up his closing arguments. Then we'll have a five-minute break, and we'll do question and answer for about 45 minutes, getting as many questions in as we can. Now, Dr. Hovind, your closing arguments. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, there must be a misunderstanding here. I don't believe I ever said tonight that science is a religion. I said evolution is a religion. Evolution is not part of science. That's the point. I think you're missing that, uh, Dr. Shermer, and I'll just reiterate that. I'm not against science. I happen to like science, okay? So, so no, I'm not against science. Now, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. You will have no excuse when you stand before God. Say, well, I believed in evolution because of the evidence. No, somebody might have led you to believe that, 
Just like some people lead their followers to believe if you blow yourself up and kill, you know, an Israeli, you get to go to heaven and get 72 wives. Okay. Well, you, you've been misled. All right. Um, the Bible says uh, they're without excuse. Verse 21. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, or in, as in the Greek, that's the brights. Uh, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God to an image made like to a corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. That's evolution. God gave them up. That'd be a horrible thing if God gives up on you. To uncleanness, to their lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Yep, got to go meet Lucy. Who was blessed forever, amen. For this God, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Romans 1 tells us why God's going to have to judge this world. They knew God, spent seven years witnessing for him, <laughs> and then uh, turned their back. They glorified him not as God. They became vain. That means self-centered in their imagination. They professed themselves to be wise. They became fools. God brought them down to idols and beasts, and God gave them up. Slippery slope happens to civilizations, happens to nations, happens to individuals. It can happen to you. Okay? Now, the Bible says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Wayne Strickland picked out his tombstone, calls himself an atheist. Well, the Bible says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I like Ray Comfort's book. His crew is video in here tonight. The, God doesn't believe in atheists. <laughs> I don't either. Question. My closing. I didn't leave my gorgeous wife and travel out here because I want to beat somebody in a debate. I want to see somebody get converted. Okay? All of you are going to die. If you die, where are you going? You ought to think about it because you're going to be dead for a really long time. <laughs> I don't care how long you live, you're going to be dead longer than that. So it's real simple. God made this world. He owns it. He makes the rules. We are guilty of breaking his rules. If you don't like his rules and you're going to deny he exists for that reason, okay, but you're going to face him anyway. He told us clearly, thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. All of us have lied. He told us, don't steal. We've all stolen. We're guilty, folks. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. I don't do this travel around and speak at universities and seminars and stuff because I'm in it for the money or in it because I like being gone. Folks, there's a war going on. You, some of you kids are being taught things in this university that simply are lies. Somebody's trying to brainwash you against the obvious. There's a creator. There's a designer. So if you die today, where would you go? You're going to be dead. If you're, if you're not saved, you're going to be punished. Or Jesus can take your place. 35 years ago, I asked the Lord to forgive my sin, take my place. And I'm going to heaven. It's not because I'm good. It's because I'm forgiven. You can have the same thing. That's why I came. Thank you so much. First question is for Dr. Shermer. Um, how did life originate? What is your best explanation? And do you believe life originated from non-life? And if so, why? Right. <laughs> An entire chemistry class in... How much do I get? Two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Um, first of all, origins of life questions are not evolution. Evolution is a theory that deals with how life changes when it already exists. The origins of life is really a chemical uh, question has to do with chemistry, not uh, biology. But that, but that aside, we have some reasonably good theories, although they need a lot more work because this is a fairly new science of how inorganic molecules become organic molecules. There's a very fine model right now that has a lot of support that clay substrates at the bottom of oceans may serve as nice mediums for which uh, simple molecules can bind and be held in their bindings into more complex molecules and how even protein chains can be formed and crude cells can be formed and so on. That's how you get started in the, in the process. So it's a very gradual, slow process. We know that, that um, it can be done just by the input of energy. Uh, either ultraviolet radiation or a spark of electricity, these sorts of things. These experiments are rather crude. No, there's not a little creature crawling out of the test tube, of course, but there are at least these uh, early rudiments of life, the beginnings of it, these basic structures, protein train, cha uh, chain structures, monomers become polymers. All this happens just by the input of energy. It doesn't require a top-down designer. In fact, it's a bottom-up uh, process that's just built into the laws of nature.
Okay, Dr. Hovind? Uh, I think the complexity of life is so great that there just simply had to be a designer. It's not possible to happen piece by piece. All the experiments so far in the laboratory to try to produce life, Miller, uh, Oprin, uh, Yuri, have, have really made the problem more complex. In this picture here, they show they're using methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen. Notice they exclude oxygen. They call it, they call it a reducing atmosphere because they know if there's any oxygen, it'll, it'll oxidize whatever tries to get together. All they've been able to do so far is get a few little amino acids, which is kind of like getting a few letters of the alphabet by randomly dropping toothpicks, okay? That can happen, I agree. You could drop toothpicks and make letters of the alphabet, but that would not explain how you get an entire book. And the difference from a few amino acids to one living cell is like the difference between a few letters of the alphabet and a whole book. It's just orders of magnitude. Now, if he wants to believe that, he can believe that, but again, he's, he's left science and gone to religion. And if he says evolution only deals with after life is here, then he's, uh, he doesn't have a coherent theory because uh, he needs to have something all the way back to the beginning, in my opinion. Uh, so that was it already? <laughs> watch my... Yeah. Watch my video number four on the table back there for more on that. <laughs> okay, question for Dr. Hoven. What is your strongest piece of evidence for creation? I think the evidence for creation would be the absolute impossibility of the contrary. If we were walking down the highway or walking down the road and we saw a swimming pool in somebody's backyard and you can see the waves you know, splashing out the top a little bit and I said, I think that pool only has water in the top foot. The rest is air underneath. Without even going to examine it, we would, you, the other person would say, that's silly. It's impossible that there not be water all the way to the bottom. That's the nature of things. Okay? It is impossible that there not be a designer. Everything is just so incredibly complex, there had to be a creator. If you're walking through the woods and you find a painting hanging on a tree, you automatically conclude there was a painter. Even if you don't see any footprints, you don't see the person who made it, there had to be a painter. If you're walking through the woods and you find a building, you don't see any footprints, you don't see any people, you still conclude there was a builder. And if you see a creation, you conclude there was a creator. So I think two things. I would say the design in nature is impossible to explain without uh, a designer. And it, the, the idea of creation is true because of the impossibility of the contrary. It is impossible that there not be a creator for something like this. Rebuttal? Yeah, I think that says it all. It, it gets right back to my first slide. I think you should be more explicit here in step two. Then a miracle occurs. Um, Kent Hovind's answer to what's the best piece of evidence you have for the creation is the impossibility of the contrary. So all he's got is, I don't believe your explanation, therefore the default is my explanation. That's not an answer. That's not, that doesn't say anything. That's not any positive evidence in support of a position. Okay. The first law of thermodynamics says matter and energy is neither created nor destroyed. How do you account for the origin of matter and energy, and is your answer scientific? That'd be me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Two minutes. <laughs> oh, I see. We're doing that back and forth. <clears throat> um, Operators are standing by for my tape. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, well, this is standard. Uh, doesn't evolution violate the second law of thermodynamics? No, of course it doesn't, because if you have input into a system of energy, such as the sun, then you get a reversal of entropy. That is, you get energy input, you get an increase in complexity and so forth, as long as the energy keeps coming in. Once the energy dissipates, then the, you get an increase in entropy. So then, okay, but what about the whole universe? And then we're going to end up back at these kind of ultimate questions. Well, then where did the universe come from? And where did the energy that created the Big Bang come from? And so on and so forth. And then we're back into questions that are sort of only quasi-scientific or kind of metaphysical, uh, which we can speculate on, but that isn't really a part of science. We, with science, have to work on what we have. The second law of thermodynamics, I'm amazed anybody ever brings that up anymore. It's just kind of a, a non-issue a non for, for us anymore. Okay, I disagree strongly. I think the second law is a very valid argument against evolution. The second law tells us basically everything's falling apart, okay? The Bible teaches that clearly. Everything is waxing old like a garment. Here, uh, here's Sue at 20. Here she is at 90. Here she is at 3,000, okay? Uh, now, the evolutionists will say you can overcome the second law by adding energy. This is ludicrous. Uh, you, adding energy is destructive unless there's something to utilize the energy. The Japanese added a whole bunch of energy to Pearl Harbor one day. They didn't organize anything, okay? 
We returned the favor a few years later and added energy to a couple of their cities and didn't organize a thing for them. Adding energy is destructive unless there's something to use the energy. It's true the sun adds energy to the earth, but it's going to destroy the roof on your house, not build it. The sun's energy is going to destroy your entire house. It's going to destroy the upholstery on your car. It's going to destroy the roof on your car. It's going to destroy the paint job on your car. There's only one thing that can use the sun's energy. By the way, the moon gets the same energy we do. Okay, It doesn't make anything up there. The sun's energy is added to the earth, and, and chlorophyll is able to capture it and use it. So it's a silly argument to say, all you got to do is add energy, and that'll fix it. That is simply silly, not true. Okay. Okay, question for Dr. Hoven. Dr. Shermer held up the example of Lucy's pelvic bone. What is your response to Lucy being a common ancestor between men and ape? I give a 30-minute answer to that on a video number <laughs> two on the table back there. Uh, and by the way, he mentioned something earlier about, you know, all I had was a religion, and he said, well, that's not, we need a better answer for step two. Okay, well, all you have is a religion also. But see, I'm not asking for my religion to be paid for by taxpayers. You are. So the burden of proof is on you, not me. Okay? Lucy's, um, Lucy was nothing but a three-foot-tall creature, probably some type of chimpanzee kind of animal. Charles Oxner had studied every single bone of Lucy and said it's, it's not a missing link. He did what's called a computer, computer multivariate analysis. I would point out, though, uh, from a much bigger picture, no fossils count as evidence for evolution. None. You can't prove this critter. Go ahead and turn it on. You can't prove Lucy had any kids. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? No fossils count as a bigger picture, and even if Lucy is something unusual in the form of a chimpanzee three feet tall with a little unusual feature, that still doesn't prove it's evolving to something else. It could have been a creature that went extinct. So this kind of evidence would not hold up for three seconds in a court of law. But see, the problem is evolution doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. It only has to be made believable to a bunch of students who have an academic, where the teacher has an academic and psychological advantage over the students. That's why evolution, the people believe that. The guys who study Lucy say, look, this is not a missing link. Uh, Charles Oxner, I'll show you the reference here. You can check it out for yourself. Studied every single bone and said, Lucy, there we go. Uh, the various australopithecines are indeed more different from both African apes and humans in most features than the latter are from each other. It's not a missing link. No fossils count to begin with, and even then, Lucy's not a good fossil to demonstrate evolution. Okay? Oh. Um, taxpayers, here we go. Okay, back to the taxpayers business. Look, what, what makes it into public science course textbooks is the best science of the day, whatever that happens to be. There's nobody conspiratorially trying to plant it in there uh, because they're anti-religious or anything like that. If the science isn't good, it, it is taken out of the textbooks, and this happens all the time including within the biological sciences and evolutionary theory. Things change all the time as new evidence comes in. Um, the reason you don't see creationist stuff in science textbooks is because they're not producing any science. If you want to be taught as a science, you actually have to do the science. And there's no science done. They don't write any science textbooks. They don't publish any scientific papers. All they do is go through science textbooks and science papers and pick out what they think are errors and say, that's our science. That's not science. You actually have to produce something, produce evidence of a creator, for example, and they don't have that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Dr. Shermer. You say there is evidence for the Big Bang. Can you give us your strongest evidence that it occurred? Oh, I was told there'd be no math uh, in this debate. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so this really has nothing to do with evolution. This is a whole different theory. And the, the larger problem here is that uh, Kent Hovind and so many people uh, have a mis- interpretation of what science is. They think of it as the physics lab experiment as the model of what science is. So much of science is inference. So much of it is inferring from different pieces of data, sequences. So much of the historical sciences uh, are not anything at all like uh, a, a physics experiment. So when you say, well, the Earth is only 6,000 years old or whatever, well, look, this is going to throw out all of cosmology, astronomy, chemistry, biochemistry, geology, historical geology, paleontology, archaeology. Don't think this has to do with evolutionary theory. All of science is completely wrong if he's right. There's no point of having any science. He says he's pro-science. He's completely anti-science because if he's right, it all goes out the window. 
So in terms of the Big Bang, um, well, there's a whole series of, of um, pieces of evidence that have to do with how explosions occur, uh, what kinds of elements you would expect to find the most of if this explosion occurred, and we do find them. Again, I said the Big Bang was debated for many decades. And lots of people didn't accept it. A lot of hardcore scientific skeptics didn't believe it until the, the evidence amounted so much that it just became inevitable to accept it. Well, I, the sky is falling, is what he's trying to say, folks. If we believe in creation, everything's going to fall apart. I mean, all the sciences have to be thrown out. That's ludicrous. All the branches of science were started by creationists. The evolution theory has done nothing for the advancement of science. That's not why we put a man on the moon. That's not why you can do open heart surgery. Evolution is a useless theory, even if it's true. It is absolutely useless as far as science goes. You don't have to believe in creation or evolution to study science. You can learn about the biceps, the triceps, the deltoid, and all the different muscles of the body and never get into origins. It doesn't matter. No doctor doing surgery cares, uh, cares at all about evolution while he's cutting somebody's heart out to replace it. It's, it's a useless theory. And then, and then there is no advancement in modern science from this evolution theory. The Big Bang Theory, I think, is a great hindrance to, and many other theories about evolution are a great hindrance to science. Uh, there's all kinds of evidence against the Big Bang, the counter-rotation of at least two planets, Venus and Uranus. At least eight of the 91 known moons are spinning backwards. Uh, some whole galaxies are spinning backwards. Three planets have moons going both directions at the same time. This can't happen with the Big Bang. You need to study some physics on that one. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Hoven, you admitted that roaches become resistant to pesticides. Please defend your stance that this is not a beneficial mutation for their kind. Roaches become resistant to pesticides uh, because some, some of the roaches in that population already had a resistance. When they dug up some of the guys that tried to find the Northwest Passage, uh, we can shut it down, I don't have a slide ready for this. They were guys that froze to death trying to find the Northwest Passage up in Canada years ago. When they dug up and did an autopsy on them, they find some of them were uh, resistant to penicillin. Well, that's interesting. Penicillin hadn't been invented yet. See, there, there are some people that already have a resistance to certain things in their system. So let's say you got a thousand roaches and five of them have a resistance to a certain pesticide because of whatever reason. Okay, you put that pesticide down, it kills all but those five. Those five then become the grandparents of everybody else, of so the new roach population, and now you get a whole population of you know, resistant roaches. That, that happens. It is still a roach. It is only something already in the gene code that, that was selected. You selected for that particular thing to survive. In this case, artificial selection instead of natural selection. That is not a process that's adding information, and it's not a process that's going to turn a rock to a human. In 20 bazillion years, it's not going to happen. Um, okay, well, <clears throat> I'm not a big expert on cockroaches, although I like the hammer part. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but these are fine examples of, of what we would call microevolution. The question is, how do we go from microevolution to macroevolution? One of the difficulties almost everybody has with this concept is that we evolved to consider ourselves on, in terms of time frames of years or decades, and it's hard to conceive of thousands of years or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. It just seems, you know, impossible. It's counterintuitive, yet there it is in the evidence, and so it makes it hard to grasp. We see the changes. We see the dogs changing in the course of 15,000 years, humans in the course of 150,000 years with all the variety we have today. There it is. It's in the genes. It's in the fossils. It's, it's corroborated across all these different independent lines of inquiry. Um, it's, um, it, it's the power of genetic variation and selection, which is a bottom-up designer. Okay. okay. Now, this was a question directed to you. What would you say is the creationist's strongest argument for the existence of God? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is like on your... Um, your application to graduate school and says, what's your weak point? <laughs> I always put like chocolate. <laughs> I study too hard. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, I actually think that the best arguments creationists have today for inferring design in nature um, are probably those of uh, William Dembski maybe with the um, irreducible complexity of, of complex structures like the flagellum and so on. We have terrific answers for these. This little debate has been going on for about six years now. 
Um, but I think those are the best arguments for inferring design, which has nothing to do with inferring God. In fact, they purposely say that that's not what they're trying to infer, although it's pretty obvious they are. Um, but still, in terms of what's the best arguments for God herself, I guess um, it, would, it would just be that it does look like the universe is designed. And in fact, let's just say it. It is designed. It's a kind of a jury-rigged, bottom-up designer, but that is a kind of design. So when people intuitively say, you know, it just looks designed, why don't we just say, well, yeah, that's right, because it is, in a way, not a top-down intelligent designer, a bottom-up tinker designer, designed nonetheless, so the inference, in a way, is correct. I think it's interesting. Evolutionists argue against design using arguments they designed. <laughs> think about that one. Um, this is the book he's referring to, Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box, excellent book. Uh, showing how complex living systems cannot evolve piece by piece. There are too many interconnecting parts that depend on each other. He uses the illustration of a mouse trap with five basic parts. You have to have at least those five parts. You remove any more, it ceases to function. Your car has thousands of parts. Some it can live without, or run without. Some it simply cannot run without. The hair on the bacteria, for instance, has a little tiny motor that attaches to the, the bacteria that allows that thing to swim around. That motor is so tiny, eight million of them would fit on the cross section of a human hair. The motor turns 100,000 RPM forwards or backwards. Now, if you want to believe that happened by chance, you're welcome to believe that, but that's an incredibly complex little motor and really micro-miniaturized. Anybody who's done any work with computers knows the smaller you try to make it, the more problems you start to have, and that's why the cost goes up for a laptop instead of a desktop. So, no, I think there's evidence of design every place, even down to the micro level. Okay, dinosaurs. What are your opinion on dinosaurs, Dr. Hoven, and where do they fall into the creation versus evolution argument? That happens to be my favorite topic. I have Dinosaur Adventure Land. Uh, my website is Dr. Dino. My phone number is 479-DINO. Uh, I have dinosaurs on my tie. Uh, I'm sick and tired of the evolutionists using dinosaurs to teach kids that they lived millions of years ago. The fact of the matter is that they were called dragons all through history. The word dinosaur was just made up in 1841. These creatures have always lived with man. There are thousands and thousands of legends and cave drawings and artwork and uh, 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 video number three on the table back there covers all that. Uh, dinosaurs have lived with man all through history. They simply called them dragons. The Bible says before the flood came, the people lived to be 900 years old. Well, reptiles never stop growing. Even today, they don't stop growing. Most species don't. So in the pre-flood conditions, the reptiles would grow to be gigantic. Uh, they were dinosaurs living with Adam and Eve. Then Noah took them on the ark probably babies, just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. And after the flood, people killed them. And all through history, there are stories of people killing dragons. And there could be a few still alive today. There have been thousands of sightings like Loch Ness Monster, Lake Champlain Monster. A dead one washed up on the beach in California, 1925, a dead plesiosaur. Fish fishermen watched it get killed. There are pictures on my website, and I have them here, but I don't have time to get them up because uh, I have 7,000 slides. So if you'd start asking the questions in the same order that I have the answer, <laughs> it'd be a lot faster. Okay. Will do. <laughs> we need to have live internet and just Google ready to go. Okay, there's my answer. <laughs> why, why do you suppose fish died in the flood? How do you explain that? All these ocean swimming dinosaurs died in the flood? Just all of a sudden couldn't swim? Are we supposed to believe this? Where in the geological record have you ever seen a dinosaur and a human together? You never have. This is an empirical test. This young lady is shaking her head. Yes, you have seen a dinosaur and a human together? Good. Come see me later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, this would be a falsifiable test of evolution. If you could actually find a dinosaur or a trilobite or whatever and a, and a hominid uh, fossil in the same bed, that would do it. That would be a huge point against evolutionary theory. Has never been found. Okay, Dr. Shermer, regarding bird evolution, is there any living or fossil evidence that a leg became a wing and a scale became a feather? 
Yeah, good question. Um, there's actually a fair amount of good evidence now for the evolution of birds from dinosaurs and the transition from scales to feathers and the transition from uh, walking limbs to flying limbs. It operates in principle with the slide I put up with the each part has a particular function that served some other purpose that in the end got co-opted for a different purpose. And the wing is a classic example, almost surely was once a thermodynamic regulator, a heat regulator, which then gets co-opted to use for something else later. Therefore, a half a wing has some purpose. In terms of the fossil record, it's pretty good now. We actually have quite a few transitional fossils from dinosaurs to birds. And there's a number of paleontologists that think today the, birds are, the dinosaurs are still living, not as dragons in the Bible. By the way, where are the unicorns that are referred to in the Bible? Where, where are those, either in the fossil record or today? I'd like to see one of those. Another one of those interesting tests that continues to get failed. So uh, in terms of the paleontological record, it's pretty good. We have to remember that most beasties that die get eaten. They don't fossilize, hardly any fossilize. So it's an amazing fact that we have so many fossils that we do. It's an embarrassment of riches. Okay, uh, I disagree strongly. Every one of the so-called evidences for dinosaurs turning to birds are, are, have been proven wrong. Archaeoraptor was listed as oh, ev proof for evolution, the missing link. <clears throat> National Geographic, breaking news, we found the missing link. A couple of months later, uh, oops, we got fooled. <clears throat> Some Chinese guy glued a tail, glued a, a bird tail on a reptile and sold it for $80,000 and the Smithsonian bought it. As a Chinese smuggler to brought it in, a great embarrassment to modern paleontology from USA Today. We can go all day about that. The tale was added by an entrepreneurial Chinese farmer. <laughs> yep. Uh, which one you want to talk about? Archaeoraptor? Uh, it, 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 uh, the little dino fuzz, they call it. We got plenty of stuff on that. Video number four, folks. You need that one. Uh, this dino fuzz is not dino fuzz at all. It's just simply a, a, simply a chemical reaction that takes place as things fossilize, and it's been proven over and over. There's a considerable, considerable body of evidence that these fossil traces known as dino fuzz have nothing to do with feathers, Alan Fiducia writes, and he believes in evolution. So uh, you're mistaken about that. Thank you. Question for Dr. Hoven. How do you account for most people's belief that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, carbon dating, radioactive dating, Potassium argon dating. Um, go ahead and put the screen up there while I've got it here. This is the California's Nessie washed up on the beach. California, I told you about earlier, had a neck 20 feet long. Everybody said it was a plesiosaur right up here in California. Uh, as far as carbon dating, uh, that's anybody who believes carbon dating works doesn't understand the problems associated with it. And it's not true to say the majority of people believe in evolution or believe the Earth is billions of years old. The majority of Americans do not believe the Earth is billions of years old. As far as carbon dating, when it was first invented in 1947 to 53, Willard Libby invented it at University of Chicago, got a Nobel Prize for it, and then moved to Stanford. In 1949, the lower leg of a mammoth, carbon dated 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000 from the same animal. Talk about a slow birth. <laughs> 1963, living mollusk shells dated 2,300 years old. It's not getting any better. That's 14 years of practice with carbon dating. 1970, they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. 1971, freshly killed seal dated 1,300 years old. 1975, one part of a mammoth is 40,000 years old, another part's 26,000. It's not working. 1981, it's not working. It, ha it has never worked. 1984, living snails, carbon date 27,000 years old. <laughs> one atheist said, well, yeah, we know why that one didn't work. Okay, then how do you know any of them do work? How, if you know some of them don't work, how could you possibly prove any of the carbon dates are working? You can't. I mean, in a court of law, they'd laugh at you for bringing in carbon dating. 1992, two mammoths found side by side. One carbon date's 22,000 years old. Another one carbon date's 16,000 years old. This is not an exact science, folks. 1996, up at Berkeley University, they used two advanced, two different dating techniques. They found these bones are 53,000 to 27,000. That's a 96% error. This is not science. This is fairy tale stuff. It gets worse with potassium argon dating. You need video seven for that one. <laughs> I wrote a
wrote a book called Denying History. It's about the Holocaust deniers. Here's their reasoning. You know, those Holocaust historians used to say that there were 21 death camps. Now they're saying that there's only six. See, they're wrong. There was no Holocaust. Holocaust historians used to say they gas people at Dachau. Now they're saying they didn't gas people at Dachau. See, they didn't gas anybody anywhere. This is the same line of reasoning that the evolution deniers use as the Holocaust deniers. In fact, of course, everybody makes mistakes. Errors and fakes have nothing to do with the large body of knowledge to tell us what's actually true about history and the past. The fakes, by the way, and all these errors were exposed not by creationists, but by scientists, because scientists have integrity, and the science itself has a built-in self-correcting machinery that drives it toward better and more accurate facts. Okay, this is a little bit of a long one. Bacteria appears to be the most efficient reproducing organism on the planet. Uh, what is your best evidence that for the origin of meiosis, male-female reproduction? Well, hmm. Bacteria are the dominant form of life on Earth. And in terms of how they evolved, reproductive methods has to do with um, really the going back to the beginnings of how monomers turn into polymers, how polymers turn into long protein chains, how long protein chains turn into something like RNA, how, how RNA starts to replicate into DNA and so on and so on into a, a complex reproductive system as we see in bacteria today. We have a fairly good understanding of this in two ways. One, through the vast variety of complexity of life today where you have from simple to complex organisms and you can see the historical sequence in the different kinds of reproductive methods that there are and from simple to complex how they range. That's part one of a historical science. The same way that astronomers know how stars evolve by looking at different stars alive, if you will, today at different stages. The second way is looking at the actual cells themselves and the structures within them. These complex eukaryote cells that we're composed of are actually composed of these very simpler prokaryote cells, which we just call these little structures like mitochondria and so forth, that, that were once themselves free-floating cells that through this symbiotic process of cooperation then um, coalesced into these larger structures. And so these two ways show us, again, Historical sciences are by necessary inferential from which we have to infer from several lines of evidence. We now know this, again, through these independent lines of inquiry that converge to this same conclusion. Okay, that's a fairy tale, if I ever heard one, uh, because it's here, it must have happened. That's like, you know, the, the motor slowly evolved to fit into the car, and, you know, they're, they're like this... It, it, this is a misunderstanding and a gross oversimplification of how complex bacteria are. Bacteria are really complex. People say, don't bacteria become resistant to drugs? That's proof for evolution. Well, that's based on a misunderstanding, okay? Dr. Spetner points out, it's based on a misunderstanding for the mutations that cause antibiotic resistance still involve information loss. For example, to destroy a bacterium, the antibiotic streptomycin attaches to a part of the bacterial cell called ribosomes. Mutations sometimes cause a structural deformity in ribosomes. Since the antibiotic cannot connect with the misshapen ribosome, the bacterium is resistant. But even though this mutation turns out to be beneficial for the moment, it still constitutes a loss of information. No evolution has taken place. The bacteria are not stronger. In fact, under normal conditions with no antibiotic present, they are weaker. Example would be if somebody's going through town handcuffing everybody, hauling them off to kill them, and you don't have any arms. They can't handcuff you. So you survive the purge. Well, that might be beneficial for the moment, but it's still a loss of information and puts you back in the population with armed people, and you're going to have you at a disadvantage. So, no, bacteria, this, this bacteria are incredibly designed, uh, not, not evolved. Okay. Question for Dr. Hoven. 
please explain the claim that 97% of the DNA between humans and chimp are similar? Can you give me 10 seconds to get the slides up? And then I got two minutes. Okay. No. <laughs> DNA between humans and chimps is similar. Uh, the claim that the DNA is 97% similar is simply false, okay? It's about 95% according to the most. It used to say 98.6 in the textbooks. Here we go. Uh, here, this textbook says 96% similar between orangutans and humans, 98% similar between chimpanzees and humans, proving a common ancestor 15 million years ago. Actually, Barney Maddox was the leading genome researcher on this project. He said, concerning the genetic differences, the genetic difference between human and his nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, that's a gap of 48 million nucleotides. And a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an animal. There is no possibility of a change. Now they've discovered instead of 98% similar, it's only 95%. So there are millions and millions of millions of differences. Now, if somebody wants to believe that proves common ancestor, they can believe whatever they want, but that's not common sense. I think it proves a common designer. That's why there are similar structures in many things. The Honda Prelude and the Honda Accord are very similar because they both evolved from a skateboard by the same logic. Um, so, uh, the, the idea that the, bacteria, that the uh, uh, DNA code is supposed to prove some kind of evolutionary relationship is ludicrous, okay? The DNA code is so incredibly complex to begin with. I could point out that Microsoft PowerPoint and Microsoft Word have millions of exact lines of code. I mean, they're identical. I can click spell check in Word and I can click ch spell check in PowerPoint get the same results. That proves this all evolved from Morse code over billions of years. <laughs> well, whether the DNA sequence similarity is 98.6 or 95.2 or 97 is, in a way, irrelevant. The number keeps changing because that's how science works. It keeps refining and testing and changing and so on. It's one of the beauties of science. There are no final absolute truths. You're not going to read in Genesis what the number is. It's done through DNA. The DNA sequencing themselves is only one measure of commonality between us and the other great apes and then us and the monkeys and us and other mammals and so on. It's just one measure. There's a whole bunch of half a dozen different biochemical measures of similarity and differences. Then, of course, there's all the anatomical and physiological comparisons, then there's the fossil comparisons. Again, I can't hammer this point home strong enough. It's this convergence of evidence from different lines of inquiry that leads us to these conclusions. When Vince Sarich first put forth that idea that we are more closely related to chimps because he had this one, one particular biochemical test, um, people thought he was crazy. But it is now supported simply because there's so much evidence from other lines of inquiry. Thanks. Okay, last two-minute question for you. Humans need 11 systems in their body to survive. Circulatory, muscular, nervous, skeletal, etc. 11? Was that 11? It's, yes. Yep. Okay. 11. Which evolved first? Which evolved last? Which evolved in between? Or did they all appear at once instantly? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Um, this isn't even quite the right question because it infers that, that all systems had to be in place for the thing that we call a human to be a human. But that's not how evolution works. It's not the 747 out of the junk pile of parts. That's not how it happens. It's this long, slow, gradual tinkering process. Uh, circulatory systems, muscular systems, and so on. All mammals have these, and all organisms going all the way back uh, hundreds of millions of years have these various systems of, of different kinds. It's why we have these kind of poorly designed, good enough to get by, um, systems that we have because they're, they're from these common ancestors from long before. Um, our legs, the veins in our legs are okay. It would be nice if the, there were more valves and they were a little stronger because with bipedalism, you have more blood pressure from top to bottom than if you're a quadruped. But we began as a quadruped, so we're stuck with the veins and valves that we have that have been slightly modified and improved. An intelligent designer would have made them much better than they actually are. Same thing with lower back discs. If we were 
um, designed to be uh, bipeds, it would be great if our, the discs were much thicker and denser and didn't wear out so, so quickly. Yet, especially if you lived 900 years, your back would never make it. But, but we weren't designed by an intelligent designer. We used to be quadrupeds. There was far less pressure on the lower spine than there is now. That's what I mean by this bottom-up tinker. It works fairly well. We get by fairly well, but not in any kind of incredible, omniscient, perfectly designed uh, structure, which is what you would expect from a top-down designer. What you actually see is perfect evidence of a bottom-up tinker called evolution. Well, I think much of the problem here is uh, total misunderstanding. In the first place, we are not poorly designed. I think we're, it's an amazing design. I think just one single cell in your body is more complex than the space shuttle, and the average human has 50 trillion cells. So. It's ludicrous to say that we, uh, this all just came about by chance and we're poorly designed. Secondly, poor design is a lousy argument for evolution, it's when you, especially when you consider, as I said earlier, we are a copy off of a copy off of a copy off of a copy off of a copy off a copy of Adam. It's amazing we're sitting here talking about it. You make a, take a piece of paper, copy it on the copy machine. Now take your copy and make a copy. Take that copy and make a copy. Do that about a thousand times and see if you can still read it. Get a computer program, any computer program. Make a copy it onto a disk. Then copy it to another disk. Then copy it to another disk. Do that a thousand times. See if it'll still run. That's the DNA code that we have, folks. It's incredibly complex. I think the only reason anybody would say this happened by chance and there was no designer is because they don't want to find that designer. The atheist can't find God for the same reason a thief can't find a policeman. Okay, last question for Dr. Hoven. Why do you believe creation science is not taught in the public schools? Well, first place, it is taught in thousands of public schools. There, there's never been a law against teaching creation science. Uh, there were two school, two states that passed laws to require creation be taught, Arkansas and Louisiana. The court struck both of those down, wisely, I suppose, because if you passed a law that said teachers are required to breathe, they would strike that down too, okay? You can't require somebody breathe, and you can't require they teach creation. They never said you couldn't teach creation, and quite, quite the opposite is true. The courts have ruled consistently you can teach it if you want, but it cannot be required. I cover that in all the court cases on video number five back there on the table. Uh, so uh, there are thousands of teachers that do teach creation. I teach creation. I go into public schools quite often and teach. We have public schools come visit our dinosaur adventure land, and we teach them creation. It's not a problem. Uh, there's no law against it. Uh, I, and I'm not against teaching evolution in schools either. As I said earlier, I'm against teaching lies in schools. Don't tell them you have a vestigial tailbone or the snake has a vestigial pelvis or the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Don't lie to the kids. I mentioned in uh, Arkansas House Representatives uh, Committee considering a bill in Arkansas to, to not buy textbooks with lies in it. We went through 30-some lies in the textbooks, and, the, I, and one of the representatives uh, said, are, is it true all these things are, are lies? I said, yes, I went for 45 minutes. These are lies. One evolutionist got up afterwards and said, well, this is an anti-evolution bill. The representative said, evolution's not mentioned in this bill. This bill just says don't lie to the kids. And this uh, evolutionist ACLU lawyer at the, there said, well, all these things are used to support the evolution theory. Well, duh, if that's all you've got to support your theory is lies, get a new theory. That's the way science works. Be skeptical. When you've got to use lies to support your theory, you ought to be skeptical of that, Michael. Come on now. If you write an article on that. All right, let's be skeptical. Sure, let's do it. Okay. Sure, let's hear your new theory, Kent Hovind. What is the theory you have to offer to replace the scientific theory of evolution? The answer is no theory. There is no theory. No, I've got a very the reason point. it's not taught, the reason it's not taught in science classes is because it's not science. There's nothing to teach. If you got anything out of tonight, you heard there's nothing to teach. All you would do is say, God did it. Okay, what do you want to do for the rest of the hour and for the rest of the semester? There's nothing to teach. There's no science. If you want to teach it in Bible classes, fine. Religion classes, theology classes, fine. But there's nothing to teach. There's nothing to do. There is no science. That's why it's not taught. Okay. Well, this concludes our debate. Let's give him a round of applause.